tonight, Lord God, we ask that you'll send us the help of your Holy Spirit, that we might understand your word, that we might take it into our hearts, and that we might be inspired by what we hear to serve you with greater zeal. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please sit down. Well, if I am supposed to explain everything to you in detail, I really hope that gift of prophecy of yours is well developed. I'll tell you something, I'm really glad that I've discovered this evening I'm not the only Anglican clergyman who walks around with bare feet. They do it all the time in Amman. No, I don't. All right, okay. I'm glad it's a sign that I'm not called there then. Right, okay. We've come in in the middle of a, a, a vision of John's in Revelation. We are asked to understand that this is being written by a man, a follower of Jesus, who is in a Roman prison camp in the island of Patmos. He's there because he's being persecuted for his faith. And at the beginning of the book, he sees a vision of the risen and glorified Jesus Christ. He's told to write down what he sees. He's told that what he writes down is so amazing that if you read it, you'll get blessed. Revelation 1 verse 3, if you don't believe me. And he goes on to write down messages to the seven churches at the western end of what we call Turkey. He's then given another vision where he is asked to look through an open door into heaven. And last week, Tim was sharing with us something of what he sees there, and I haven't got time to go into all of it. But essentially, the first thing that he sees when he goes into heaven is a throne. Now, that may seem not to have any significance, but actually it has a tremendous significance. Because, of course, he's writing to churches which are generally being persecuted. He's under persecution himself. And the feeling that is running amongst all the Christians of that time is that it's what matters is the decisions being taken by the emperor in Rome. That in Rome there is a throne where a man sits whose will is law. Or so it seems. And the first thing that God is trying to show to John at this difficult time of persecution when it appears that the church might be on its last legs is that actually there is a throne in heaven where all things originate. It is not the emperor of Rome who sits on that throne, but God. And what happens is down to the one who sits on that throne in heaven and not to the man sitting on the throne in Rome. Things, says John, are not as they appear to be. If you look around, you get the idea that the church is being persecuted and that tomorrow it might go out of existence altogether. But that is not so. There is a throne in heaven. It is not the emperor of Rome who sits there. And everything originates from the one who sits on this throne, who is glorious and who is majestic and who is above all things. And in fact, all creation bows down to worship him, whether that is the earthly creation or whether it is the heavenly creation. And he describes these elders which I'll try and interpret for you later, and these living creatures who do nothing, we're told, except bow down and worship the one who sits on the throne. You are worthy, O Lord, our, our Lord and God, in chapter 4, verse 11, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So this vision, which is pivotal for the whole book of Revelation, is gathered around the idea 
that <clears throat> the emperor of Rome is not in charge. What happens both now and in the rest of human history depends on the one who sits on the throne. And as he looks more closely, he sees that there's something going on. This is a moving picture. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. So a lot depends on this scroll and what's on it. And we have to interpret that if we're to understand what follows. Now, I'm not claiming to be right on this, but I'm going to make a suggestion to you as to what this scroll is. It says that it's written on both sides. That's quite unusual for a scroll. It's absolutely full. It's got seven seals on it. Symbolically, that means it is sealed up as hard as it can be. I'd like to suggest that symbolically what this scroll is, is the purposes of God for the rest of created time. Because <clears throat> this is about the one who sits on the throne being the one who is really in charge. And as the seals are released from this scroll, so things begin to happen. They're not all nice things, but they are things which we can identify as happening in every generation since the time that this was written. And so, <clears throat> on the con upon the contents of this scroll depends the rest of history. And it's important that there is someone who is able to unlock what is written on that scroll in order that history can un unroll or unfold as the one who sits on the throne decrees that it should. But there's a problem. There's nobody at this point who is worthy to actually take that scroll and unseal it. And so as a result, John, who is watching this, is so sad that he breaks down and weeps. And then, as it were, someone taps him on the shoulder and says, don't worry. There is someone who is able to take that scroll and unlock it. He said, his name is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And so John looks, <clears throat> expecting to see this incredible lion. And in verse 6 it says, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain. The lion is a lamb. And <clears throat> that symbolism is, of course, not lost because from the very earliest time that the first disciples met Jesus Christ, the words of John the Baptist were, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And so this is to do with the taking away of sin, the forgiving of sin, and the ability through that action to unlock the rest of human history. And so John describes this lion who is actually a lamb, the lamb looking as if it had been slain. The lamb stands in the center of the throne. He's encircled by everything. It says he had seven horns. That's, uh, the horn is a symbol of power in Israel. The expression seven horns is one who possesses power. Um, and he had seven eyes, it said, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Or you can translate that as the sevenfold spirit of God sent out into all the earth. There are not seven holy spirits, there is only one. And so <clears throat> this, this lamb is also filled with the spirit of God. 
And he comes and he takes the scroll out of the right hand of the one who sits on the throne. And this sets off another great explosion of worship, which is referred to as a new song in verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll, they sing, and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And so, <clears throat> the, the, the lion who is the lamb takes this scroll and as chapter 6 begins, he starts to take the seals off. And as he takes these seals off one by one, things begin to unfold which <clears throat> are detailed in chapter 6 and which <clears throat> are sometimes um, good and sometimes not very nice because they're about persecution and the way in which the church should stand up to persecution and opposition. But I'm not here to expound chapter 6. You'll have to come back next Sunday. And so, <clears throat> what we are told at this point is that in heaven, there, is, there was a plan waiting to be unlocked. That these things could not happen until the one called the Lamb of God had died and had risen again. And that by doing so, he didn't just forgive sins, but he set off a series of events in history which are still going on in our time and to which the church in any age is able to relate. And we've probably heard a little bit about that this evening in what Chris has shared. And that there are a great many parts of the world where it would appear that the church is on the way out, that it can't survive for long. And that's why this passage is so important, because it remains true. The things that we see around us are not what they appear to be. It might appear to us that anybody but God is in charge of the unfolding of what is going on around us. But that is not the case. We worship a God whose throne in heaven is unmoved and under whose direction all things that happen are controlled. And the really good news about this is that every one of us, if we are Christians, are involved in this story. Because it says that as this worship unfolds, this worship is delivered by a group called the 24 elders. Now, <clears throat> um, there are a number of interpretations of this, but what I understand that as meaning is, is this, that in the Old Covenant, God's people were represented by 12 tribes. In the New Covenant, the church is founded on 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And so I believe that the 24 elders is therefore a picture of God's people in both Old and New Covenant. And therefore, this picture of the elders falling down and worshipping includes us as those who have come to believe under the new covenant. And so, this worship that explodes is something that we can relate to. And isn't it interesting that several worship songs, or a great many worship songs, have been written and based on these very words from Revelation chapter 5. Why do we relate so well to that? Because it's a passage about us as well as a passage about others. And that if we understand nothing else about what's going on or if we're not involved directly in the church being persecuted, all that we, what we should be doing is getting on with the business of worship, of actually making sure that what this says truly does happen that we just fall down before God as we are able to, to praise and worship him for all that he has done for us and for making us who are worth nothing and who deserve nothing into a kingdom and priests to the Lord our God. Now, if that's not a fantastic message, I don't know what is. 
And the story's not over. Um, the rest of the book of Revelation is, is about the unfolding of that story. But this is where we begin. And if we feel a place in our lives or in our own situations where we are beleaguered and under pressure and where it seems that the church might just as well not have been there at all, we are to reflect on the fact that things are not what they appear to be. And if you and I could get a peek into heaven right now, this is what we would see going on with God on the throne in control of all that happens around us and the one who, because of the work of Jesus Christ, will have the victory. And you and I are part of that.